Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Anna, and uh, today I would like to share a research model that I developed about two years ago. It's focused on cybercrime uh, intelligence collections. Um, the model was originally developed like two years ago, and for the, during the past two years, I put a lot of thoughts and my personal working experience into it. And hopefully today I can share with you this, uh, some sort of like playbook or a checklist, or, or some people look at it as a map, a research map uh, uh, with you. And then hopefully it will help you, you know, in a future research process, like when you have like pieces of like initials uh, attribution and want to have a little bit more, uh, where can you go? and uh, it should be able to help you to maximize your finding and then uh, turn this, uh, the knowledge or information that you learn into an actionable uh, intelligence or a security response decision. So uh, let's look at agenda today because I personally have a little bit of ADHD. So if there's no agenda, I would go like completely off the chart. Um, so the first one, we're going to talk about the mod, uh, Hourglass model 1.0. Uh, it is the basic elements of the models. Uh, the all the critical elements will be introduced uh, there. And then uh, later on, we're going to talk about the 2.0 version. And let's hope it's more useful for you guys, because it's supposed to help people understand what kind of like threat intelligence report you could generate and what kind of like possible actions you could take with those informations in hand. And then we're going to use a case study, which is uh, the Southeast Asia-based uh, underground service targeting global two-factor or abusing global two-factor authentications. Um, and then we'll go to Q&A. So uh, this has been really not a lot to talk about. Uh, I have been a cybersecurity researcher for seven plus years uh, before I actually have bachelor and master degree in international relationship and economics. Uh, and I'm a big fan of Lego. Um, after 2010, it was a terrible timing to graduate and I couldn't get a job, so I just did whatever I can. And then I ended up here and then I love this career a lot and plan to stay a little bit longer. Um, so, okay, let's jump into the Hourglass model 1.0. So, it's designed to help researchers to collect uh, external threat uh, in a systematic way, um, especially when, you know, uh, the crime that we're focused on or threat, a uh, cyber threat we're talking about, it evolves around uh, money as financial motivated cyber crime focus. Um, to do so, we want to focus on where all the communication flow and money uh, flow met, where, which is the marketplace. Marketplace can be IRC, it can be forums, it could be any deep and dark web. In case we focus on, um, in this case, like we focus on the communications happens of like if the payments or transaction happen in like a second or separated platform, like we understand, but like in this case, in this model, we specifically focus on tracking the communication flow. Um, underground markets, I don't know if you guys have any access to it. Uh, there, it could be, you know, just IRC chat rooms or sometimes it's run in social media. We have seen like a lot of like, uh, crime or fraud related activity just like posted in social media like Facebook or Twitter. Um, so there's a lot of noise out there. So to be able to understand um, the basic baseline, most important uh, communications, we want to prioritize four types of uh, communications that it could help us quickly understand and establish the baseline of the marketplace and uh, uh, all the activity in it. So there will be four informations. Uh, the first type of information is when uh, there's like threat actors who function more like a project manager. They're like 
uh, a mastermind who select a target, they, but they don't necessarily have the skills or technology to initiate the attack. In those situations, they will go to underground market and then trying to recruit people or trying to find tools or malware exploits. And from what they tell people or their uh, recruitment like discussions and back and forth interactions with the other actors, we learn like um, they what's their general scheme is, what's their like targets, and what's their budget and possible timeline. The second type of uh, information or communication flow we want to focus on is the malicious actor. There are a lot of malicious uh, threat actors. They don't necessarily want to execute the uh, actual attack. They are very uh, technical and they just want some money and they don't want to bury that um, uh, carry that, um, you know, risk to be arrested. So they will um, just sell the products or their service on in the underground market. This include like the actual malware uh, exploits or like their service, their money mule service, uh, monetization service, and all that. The third kind of communications we talk we see is threat actors uh, who try to sell the results of their successful intrusions. This information could include like login information, PIIs, so, or um, shells. Like, so it actually happens when this kind of information happens after the uh, attack already happens. And last, not but not the least. Uh, so keep in mind that in social, uh, in the underground markets, all the threat actors are trying to maximize the financial profit they could get. So it is very common for us to see people resell the d data dump over and over again. Even though it's really, really bad that a breach may happen, um, a breach happened to you, but it is really important for um, the mer e-merchants to understand that uh, uh, you know, like after certain things happen, you have to understand how people are going to abuse it, and is it still value to the attacker? Is it kind of vanish? Is it spread from one regional underground market to a different regional underground market? So as you can see, um, the, all the information on the upper two, it's very focused on attacker size, the tools they're going to use, who are they, what is their credibility, um, how are they going to use it? So the informations are incredibly useful for proactive intelligence or decision making or detections plan um, versus the lower part is usually after the incidents already happens. So it's really useful for uh, incident response or um, mitigation plan development. So it's fairly reactive. And it also gives you like a really good understanding uh, what the, who, who the victims are and um, you know, we'll go from there. So the scope of this uh, models, first, it's online activity only. I don't think it could apply to the physical world. A second, it could uh, apply to any geolocation because we're talking about cybercrime. Cybercrime is um, not, it's divided by language because if you speak the same language, you can work with people who physically located in the other side of the world and still you know, work with them very closely as long as you you know, use the same systems, you speak the language. So most of the time we see threat actors are grouped by, um, the com uh, like attached to the community that share the same language instead of, not necessarily the geolocation. Um, the third is, it's, this model is cyber threat intelligence focus. It's not a legal analysis and not to mention when you um, try to gain access to certain uh, deep and dark web or any kind of like, more sensitive uh, source of information, so you have to uh, abide by law and all the user policy. But I don't think there is a lot of user policy in deep and dark web, so we'll check it out. Um, there's like some key definitions, key terms, um, I think not everybody understand. Like the first and is the marketplace. As I mentioned before, uh, it could be, um, wherever the communication flow and money flow exchange in the virtual world. It could be IRC, it could be deep and dark web, it could be just forms, and sometimes it's so easy to just find them through um, uh, open source like or search engines. Uh, the second one is mastermind. 
term mastermind, it refers to the threat actors who have business and target in mind, but they still need a lot of like technical and, um, assistance or others to execute attacks. The roles will focus on coordinating an attack instead of executing, um, even though they're not as interesting, but we found that like in the overall research, they're the one who usually know the scheme better. Um, they're like the one who deliver that um, crime knowledge and then actually make things happen. So what they say in underground market actually means a lot and could be very effective when you try to deploy. Knowing their mentality is really important to deploy your um, um, security measure. The third is personal identify information. Uh, it refers to any information that could be used to distinguish one person from other and others. Um, I'm sure you guys are quite familiar with that. So, um, the 2.0 version. The goal is to make it more useful. Um, so let's start with how do you generate a threat intel report into it. Did you guys still remember the first uh, communication, the flow that we talked about, like initiated by the uh, masterminds who has a plan and then go to underground market and try to recruit people or buying tools so they will post things or try to negotiate price with people? So if in this part, uh, this communication, what can be used to generate actionable uh, information or intel report would be um, the mastermind profiles. It's important to know their past uh, activity, their credibility and connections. If the more like well, the more connected they are to the underground like community, the higher the, there's a higher chance the attack may happen, and the turnover rates for them to monetize whatever they steal it would be a lot faster than um, people who like you never heard of. Um, and it's important for them to know the targets and the strategies, the timing and the current like process. Do they like already recruit whatever they wanted or it's still like very far away? Um, it kind of gives us understanding to assess like how critical this situation is. How do we, how are we going to prioritize our resource? Um, the second communication flows are threat actors bringing their products or service or goods to underground market and trying to sell to other threat actors. Um, this information could be hacking tools, the hacking service uh, tactics, and we also notice in underground market there's a lot of people trying to sell manuals. So they're like genius in crime, they figure all things out, but they don't want to do it themselves. Or they already done it, but they want to make more money by teaching others. So they will sell the tutorials um, to other for money um, as well. And um, it's usually very step-by-step -step, um, tactical uh, manuals. It's very useful for when we're trying to understand what is the froster's pain point. Um, the third one, which is after successful intrusions, we see people buy, uh, try to sell or trade um, the uh, compromised dump in underground markets. It gives us an understanding who are the victims. It could be individuals, it could be enterprise. Um, and knowing the potential buyer who try to uh, approach them and negotiate a price give us an understanding like how people value this dump because like how enterprise value the dump is very different from how threat actors or hackers um, assess it or evaluate it. it. It all depends on how are they going to make money out of it. Um, so no, having an idea who the potential buyers could be it's always very useful and also like understands um, what like having a pick of the dump can kind of give you the understanding what's the skills or the type of compromised data they have. Uh, usually people will exaggerate, uh, but sometimes like threat actors are willing to provide a screenshot or if it kind of give you an understanding like, okay, how bad the situation is. And with that in mind, you can also kind of, like I think for threat, uh, for uh, e-commerce or social medias or any companies who realize they, they're being hacked, uh, having those information can help them calculate the damage and the impact. Um, and the fourth communications will be the recurring uh, resell process, resell dumps. So it kind of, again, help the victims to calculate what's the reoccurring damage throughout the times is if they 
implement some sort of mitigate, mitigation plan, how effective it is. We can do something very cool. We can invest a lot of money to do things, but does it really effectively blocking people from monetizing it? Um, sometimes they will, like you see, they um, kind of directly blocking them from using those dump on you know the, the victims' websites. However, the information could possibly be used and the threat actor will like develop some sort of alternative monetization approach and then use the same data um, like password re reuse data to abuse other websites and we have seen that. So in general it just kind of give you an idea as what's what the long term impact looks like. Sorry for the wait and um, so, and the second part of the uh, actions we want to know is, in, on top of the threat intel report, what are the act actual actions we could take? Um, so, in terms of proactive actions, n having those knowledge or threat intels in your hands, first, uh, okay, like the first two communication flow, it's all before anything's happened to you, but you know there is external threat and capability out there. So what can you do? First, verify the tools and tactics. Does it act, could it hurt your system? Could it hurt your platform? Second, evaluate if your current detection system could actually um, detect those attacks. Would it be triggered if anything's abnormal happens or they could successfully abuse the loophole that you did not attack, uh, you did not detect so that, you know, fix it before anything happened to you. And in terms of reactive uh, information, it's like usually when some incidents or the hack or breach already happens, um, first definitely um, use it to identify the loss and the uh, impact scope and then implement a mitigation plan. And second would be evaluate, like constantly evaluate the plans or the solution that you uh, deployed. Is it helpful? Is it useful? Uh, does it stop then? And um, if not, like we have to, you have to just come up with a like, new idea and invest more like long-term strategy or solutions for it. So let's start with the uh, case study. So this is uh, about eight months ago. I was like just randomly browsing the uh, like Chinese underground market, Chinese speaking underground markets, and uh, we identified two. Uh, actually multiple uh, underground advertisements saying just, it's very random, like uh, Southeast Asian country SIM card and then a bunch of like e-commerce or social media uh, company uh, that's at global scales. Um, and so I was wondering like what's going on with the Southeast Asian countries? Like the name was like brought up so often and then, there's so many threat actors posting very similar things in Chinese speaking underground markets. So there must be something going on. Um, so I want to do a little bit more research. And at the time, in the beginning, like what I know were only two things. I know the victims that was listed um, in the previous slides, it shows it's Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Facebook, uh, WeChat, uh, Facebook again. Uh, Alibaba, Baidu, Line, WhatsApp, uh, Google, Yahoo, Twitter, and I think it's mostly because it is a Chinese uh, speaking underground market, so a lot of the uh, victims were targets, are local targets, but it also demonstrates they can use it to abuse uh, foreign uh, vendors, uh, like e-commerce as well. So I wanted to know a little bit more about it, and so the only things I know at a time is the targets and the victims, and second is what kind of underground service they're trying, they provide, but I believe there's so much more. So what I, what I wanted to know is um, I want to identify a list of keywords and um, so that through that I can find similar marketplace and collect even more information out of it. Um, and I wanted to know who are other threat actors provide similar targets, uh, similar service or similar um, hacking tools? Uh, there's so much and the number was like very diverse and 
it, like keep in mind we're talking about Chinese cyber cyber crime, like underground markets. So uh, the vent, the threat actors have the tendency to f specialize in a very small part of the entire like. Uh, hacking flow so that their uh, legal risk is as low as possible. Um, so like to put all the pieces together, it's extremely challenging and you really need to collect a lot of like sample um, and uh, raw data to put it together. And uh, the third is I want to understand what are other related uh, underground service and goods. I want to know their price and availability. It, do they can people constantly provide this kind of service, or it is like a one-time thing? Uh, I want to know the pricing strategy behind uh, each product, because there are threat actors. Um, they, you know, some some of the cybercrime, especially when it's fraud, it's very price sensitive. So when you increase the hurdle for them, the price will go up like real quick, or. Um, uh, it will drop like when it became like super easy or they find an easy target, the price will just drop super quickly like within 24 hours. And I want to see if there's any possible to find a detailed tutorials to figure out what people are trying to do. And I want to know who are the potential buyer and how do they try to make money out of it. So this is my initial findings. Uh, probably the most interesting four among many, 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 many others. Uh, the f one on your right hand side is uh, SMS uh, forwarding platform or service. So what it can do is you can rent a cell phone number and abuse as many different uh, merchants as possible or you can rent multiple cell phone numbers and abuse one specific merchant. And the cost is extremely cheap. I think it's um, 10 cents RMB. Uh, does anyone know how much is is it in US dollars? I don't know either. I should have done that, sorry. Um, and um, what, this is just one of the example. I've seen example like you can even choose like which country you want this phone number to look like. You can choose specific country but not this province, not this cities. And uh, there's a lot of like customizable uh, options. And what th this window show is, uh, you can also have various type of SMS uh, receiving service. You can use this number to receive multiple SMS, or it's just one time, or it could be audio SMS uh, message. Do you guys know there are two-factor authentications? Is um, you submit a request or you register accounts and it will call your phone number and read, um, read you uh, like six digit of number and then you have to type it down. So that's like a s slightly more advanced and technical um, SMS so people cannot just do it through script. However, even that could be bypassed in the Chinese underground market. And the pictures on the upper left hand side, there is a lady dress in style and while committing fraud. That's pretty cool. Um, what they're trying to sell is something called group control uh, software, allowing that software allows people to sit in front of computers and then just like control hundreds of like cell phone by one person and then commit like large scales of fraud. But what kind of fraud it is, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. Um, and the pictures in the middle is a uh, threat actor posted to demonstrate how many, how easy for them to acquire a large amount of SIM cards and then plug it into the GSM modem and then kind of provide people whoever wants to abuse fraud or who needs temporary SIM card and how much money they can make out of it. And uh, very, very interesting in this like same group, like people are also selling uh, referral code. Like this is just, the Airbnb one is just an example, but there are like, people are selling referral codes too, and I just couldn't understand like what they're trying to do. Um, so, and, but I was completely shocked to see um, how advanced the uh, SMS uh, forwarding code look like, Cause, you know, it's, you can rent it for 15 minutes and they ha even have like a really mature like membership uh, system. So if you rent it for this amount of money, then uh, 
you can ha also add a package so that in the next like 15 days, you have the privilege to rent this number back to you again. Um, so it, I, I thought it, they must try to uh, use or abuse two, 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 two factor authentications to bypass some sort of, um, or co commit some sort of uh, account takeover. Um, ended up, I was wrong, actually. I think after like doing a very detailed analysis, um, I realized what they're trying to do is commit fraud to create large amount of new accounts through various, uh, on, on various e-commerce platform. So what they're trying to do is um, collect stolen payment information. Now it's not very difficult. If you go to like Russian underground markets or English speaking underground market, you can buy like um, payment information or CVV card for just a couple cents. Like it, it doesn't take a lot. What's really difficult for the frost or underground threat actor is how to make money out of it. S Previously, we think they, always, they will always target people who already create accounts on the platform and then try to take over their accounts and then abuse it. But it seems like right now they're trying to think differently by creating new account to impersonate these per people. So what they do is they create this stolen information, uh, uh, they take this stolen payment information and purchase fraudulent phone or um, email. Email, it's easy. Email can be generated by script. They could do it by themselves. But phone number, it's a lot more difficult. And then they will create new accounts. So think about this. For just one specific um, victims, there's like four different ways to abuse them. The first approach to abuse or defraud them is when people, like there's a lot of like incentive um, fraud. So when um, you create a new account, that people sometimes the e-merchants will give you uh, like referral codes, so that you will have a new account with some incentive to it, and your first trip supposed to be or first purchase will be uh, have like fifteen dollars off or like twenty percent off, or you know it could the first one could be free, um, so. We've seen actors create like large amount of uh, accounts and then resell the, those incentive and referral to others and further abuse the, the uh, e-commerce platform. The second approach is you tie using this stolen payment information to actually make purchase uh, on the platforms. And then they, go, they tend to buy like very expensive electronics or um, other service or goods, and then they will resell it to consumer who just want a discounted price. Like they don't really care where this product came from. They don't really care where this iPhone came from. All they know is it's forty percent off. Um, and later on, they you know by the times the e-commerce realize it, they already receive a chargeback from the bank. Like they cannot collect the payment, but they already shipped the product. Um, the third approach is to let account age. Um, there is an increasing number of threat uh, companies start realize people are defrauding them by creating new uh, accounts. So, so they kind of put some sort of like restrictions. If you are a fairly new account, then you cannot uh, make purchase above certain money or you cannot like do anything as excessive or everything you do they will flag you re really quickly um, so but however the foster also realized it so what they do is they let they created accounts didn't do anything let the account age for 90 days and then resell those accounts to other foster who want to commit frauds on the same victims um, the so this three, first three um, approach are directly defrauding the targeted e-commerce platform. The fourth kind of fraud is more uh, sort of like advertisement fraud. You guys know there's like three type of uh, advertisement fraud. The first one is um, pay per view, like pay per, like if you some uh, like every thousand people's review your advertisement, you have to pay. And there, the second one is pay per click. If people click on it, they pay. The, uh, the e-commerce will pay the company. And then there's third one, it's called pay per actions. 
uh, the e-commerce will not pay the um, e -com the advertisement company unless people actually register a new account. So in this case, like we have also seen new accounts being used to commit the advertisement fraud because they use that referral uh, link to create accounts. And th those are all like just four different ways targeting one victims. Um, so people are very, very creative. Um, what it actually do, how did it use all those like two, the crazy SIM cards we just talked about, we just saw. Um, it's, there's like a workflow and money flow here. So the mastermind are people who pick the targets. They want to create a large number of new accounts and um, they will try to sign, sign up through API and then a targeted e-commerce will ask them to uh, bypass, uh, to pass the two-factor authentication. And here comes the uh, two approach for masterminds to make it happen. Uh, the first approach is sometimes they will buy uh, a large number of SIM cards, just like the ladies in the dress, like trying to do, and then they will forward, they will kind of outsource the two, two FA parts to like freelancer. We have seen in Chinese underground market, there are a lot of like college students or just in general students or jobless people who wants to make a small amount of money. They would just like go to forums or and review um, the file and then I type it in real quick and then I make a very small amount of money. And that's also how they bypass the audio uh, to a FA token as well. Like there are people who will listen to it and type it in, in within like 30 seconds. The second approach is through the mastermind direct uh, uh, hired SMS forwarding platform directly. Where, did, where does the SMS forwarding platform get the SIM card? They also purchase it from the SIM card vendors. So I think in this case, the SIM card vendor is just actually making a lot of money. So what happened is the mastermind will just use the API provided by the SMS uh, forwarding platforms and then register accounts and then try just fill in the, uh, all the SM, the two-factor uh, authentications there and then um, sign up through their API directly. So even though um, the mastermind, it's like a huge part of this um, overall workflow because they are the one who initiated, but financial wise, I think SMS vendors and SMS uh, forwarding platform are the one profit the most. Um, because of the second approach, it's like so much easier and for threat actor to use. So we have start seeing people like moving from the first uh, approach to the second one. And the reason why we see so many uh, Southeast Asia SIM cards advertisement appears in Chinese underground market, it is because um, I believe last year there's a huge like uh, strike down in China. They took down uh, like one of the biggest uh, SMS forwarding platforms. So people start moving that business to Southeast Asia markets uh, where the regulation is probably like fairly loose compared to China. Okay, so, uh, so for the previous two slides, like that's just for the, a new account abuse. And for every single of them, like I could do the same things based on the research I discover through the uh, hourglass models. Um, we know there's like four other different kind of abuse. There's, there are uh, two, uh, two FA abuse targeting account takeover. They are two FA kind of abused by like spamming, like people are trying to sign up a, a lot of like information uh, accounts and with the victims like cell phone numbers and then it almost kind of turned into like DDoSing them. And the fourth is um, people are also selling 2FA interception malware. Um, so there are ways like people will selling malware that can infect uh, victims uh, cell phone numbers and use their cell phone number to sign up new accounts and when the to the uh, verification code sent into their phones, they can uh, intercept it so victim cannot see it and they can like, reply back to the uh, e-merchants. So we want to take a step back and really review 
what are the, how are 2FA doing in the world and what is the currently most commonly used 2FA? Uh, in general, like 2FA is the most commonly used 2FA combined two components, which is something you know and something you have. Something you know refers to your, you know, your username and your password, only you know, hopefully, and uh, your PIN number. And with something you have, it's like a tokens, like usually it's your smartphones, uh, and sometimes it's your email address, a access, like you're supposed to one who have your, own, the only person have access to your emails. And in some European country, we see people use smart card, which is also a very brilliant idea, but it's harder to spread around. Um, so if you deep dive into it, uh, there are many ways to use it, but um, the risk, the most common approach now is uh, 2FA through SMS ver uh, ver verifications. However, it, it's vulnerable. Like pretty much all the approach are vulnerable, but this one, uh, the most commonly used one, we already knew there are like SMS swap, like targeting uh, the victims, and people could call into the telecom companies and kind of uh, claiming they lost the numbers and provide a bunch of like PII they already collected, and then allowing or encourage like the telecom to send them the SIM card and replace it so they could take over the uh, SMS. And the second one is um, the malware I just talked about. It can be intercepted, especially when it's uh, SMS code. Uh, so now we know like a lot of like external threats. How in the future, when we develop new approach, like we should keep in mind, we should keep that in mind um, in when, what we want to implement it. It has to be a balance between um, usability, accuracy, slash security, and the cost in general. Um, in terms of usability, there's research shows uh, all the consumers, they think it will cause some sort of user frictions, but two to three minutes process is considered acceptable by the uh, users. And actu accuracy are all this information we just collected previously. Um, we know how people are doing out there in the underground market that could abuse the 2FA, so it is not perfect. But we still need to like take into consideration and then Third is like do not try do not um, add those costs uh, to the users and or like smaller uh, merchants. So we do hope like kind of also implemented the uh, previous mastermind mentality, um, having some sort of uh, 2FA alliance and encourage uh, all the merchants work together. Um, to first, you know, like educated users, the benefits of using 2FA. Uh, second, kind of s split the cost, and uh, we believe like using some sort of like in-app uh, 2FA would be the most secure one uh, based on the knowledge we know how like external um, hacking capability could abuse the current 2FA. Okay, so the last part of today is the take away uh, for everyone uh, first, like, be yourself, dress in style, even when you're committing fraud. I'm just joking. Um, I think it's really important to remember uh, cy effective cyber defense decisions really re rely on both external threat intelligence and internal data analysis. A lot of the emergence or investigations highly focus on internal data mining or data analysis or to understand their um, user behavior. It is great, and but it's not like it doesn't complete it. It's not realistic until you also learn what is out there, how people look at the same, like the dump, how they're going to make money out of it. It's, it's like you really need to know your adversaries' pen points to kind of distract them or stop them from abusing you. Um, second one is the algorithm model is, is aimed to help researchers to maximize their information collection from the marketplace. Um, the third is use your findings to build hypothesis and evaluate existing systems uh, and policy. It is important uh, to build 
a hypothesis at the early stage and then keep evolve it. Because do you guys remember in the beginning I say I was so shocked by the, how advanced the SMS forwarding platform looked like, and so I assume it's targeting to fact uh, ATO. And then I realized no, I was completely wrong. After I like write down all the workflow and money flow, how they work together, um, the most profitable, the most vulnerable target is actually the new account. And the third, uh, last but not the least, like the adversary will always be there. They will not disappear. So use them and try to understand what is their motivation, what is their mentality, what is their tool tactics and procedure. Um, I would like to thank my friend uh, Nina helped me out with the two FA sections. And unfortunately, she couldn't join us today, but she prepared a very detailed slides, even more detailed than the one I just showed to you guys. So if you don't would like to see that version, it will be posted by end of today on the websites. Um, so that will be all. Any questions? Nope. Everybody ready for lunch? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>